Welcome to the Cabin Culture Podcast, where we spend a little more time diving deeper into all the fun parts of cabin culture. We like to think of this as both the material and imagined expressions of how cabin lovers, dwellers, builders, designers, and dreamers wish to live a more simple and authentic life. What's better than having a treehouse as a kid? Having one as an adult. Today, Janice talks with Lauren and Cam from Fort Treehouse Co., who took cabining to a whole new level, literally. As some of you may have gathered from our own stories and those of our guests, building and designing your dream cabin is not easy. Lauren and Cam managed to do both, with the added difficulty of their foundation being a living, growing tree, and level one starting some 15 feet overhead. They share with us all that it took to make something like this a reality and what it takes to keep it going from managing to marketing and even keeping books. Be sure to check out their site and socials to see the amazing project they brought to life and stay tuned for the news on their next build. Okay, now for the show. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It feels an awful lot like an intimate Zoom call. It, it does. Yeah, I know. It's so funny having these interviews where we're like talking to each other and then you listen to them. It's so different. But I know I got a message from someone the other day that was like, I listened to it while I'm on my walks. I've heard a couple like this where they tell me like where they're listening yeah. when, you know, um, and it's so fascinating because it kind of jolts me out of this feeling of like, this is just a Zoom call, like all the other Zoom calls that I do every day. And you forget yeah. that you then publish it and like hundreds of people are listening to it all over the place. And so it's actually really nice to have that reminder that the conversation is a bit bigger than you think that it is. Totally. And the other fun thing is that these conversations really place people in like a wilderness setting in a cabin setting. And so like, I think if people were watching this, it would be totally different. I know we put it on our YouTube channel and I feel so bad because the YouTube channel is very much an afterthought. And I'm sitting here in like my house office with two like very inappropriate lights, considering that I'm a videographer by trade and I would never light a video like this. They're like wicker warm lighting, but that everyone listening just thinks you're in cozy rock. That's right. That's right. I wish that I were. I would have imagined. Yeah. I've only recorded. Let's see. We recorded the first podcast episode ever there when Justin and Sean came down. And then I tried to record one more with Alexis of the Kingdom A-Frame, but we got so drunk that we couldn't use the content. That was funny. That was funny. So part two, we were both in our houses, but we we attempted it. Responsible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. A bit more responsible. We were still drinking, but it wasn't, we were just so excited. We'd been, you know, messaging each other for years on Instagram. So to like meet in real life was so exciting that it did didn't quite go as planned but that's so cool I definitely have made one like super tight friend on Instagram and we actually hang out in real life now too because she's also Canadian and lives in Ontario but we connected through like the cabin community and through our businesses and we've become we're like the same person it's really cool yeah well that's what's kind of cool about this world because I find and through these conversations have found that so many of us in our real life don't have many friends who are hosting or doing Airbnb at least initially. I think a lot of us have found that some of our friends are interested when they hear about it but aren't doing it. So this is where we find that camaraderie and that feeling of being like seen and understood and Instagram has really brought a lot of those people together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's an awesome community. Everyone is so friendly. And I always, after I listen to your pods, I'm like, usually go and check out the person you've interviewed. And if I don't already follow them, I like to send them a little message and be like, Hey, just listen to your interview. It was really great. I feel like I know you now yeah. because we yeah. were just talking about this. I just recorded. Yeah. I just recorded another episode right before this. And we were talking about how, when you, for me, it's harder. There's so many cabin accounts that it's harder for me to get invested in other accounts unless they show who they are. Because then I can put a name and a face to the cabin. And that as an extrovert and a human is easier for me to remember than like another inanimate A-frame or cabin, which I love, but like, it's not a relationship kind of love in the way that the humans are. Totally. And you know, it's hard to do that. It's, I'm guilty of it. I like, spent so much time like not putting my face on our Instagram account and Cam I mean he's fine to do whatever he's just so busy like doing all the building stuff that he doesn't ever go on our Instagram like ever yeah (laughs) um but it does make a difference when you put yourself out there and then when you kind of just get over yourself and start talking to your friends and 
really people come out of the woodworks and all of a sudden Instagram does get fun. Yes. It gets more fun. What a good yeah. point. People it miss does. that. Yeah. Because there's only so many like beautiful photos you can post, you know, at least for me, I like learning things. Everybody likes learning things. I like talking to people. I like seeing people's process. I like sharing our process. I think that's why sometimes I stop sharing because I'm like, what is there to share? Like, right. Now, I know not when things. you're not in the middle of a build means when you're not in the middle of a build, but mm -hmm. it's amazing what people will engage with. That's not just pretty pictures of an Airbnb. Yeah. Because the reality is a lot of us who own cabins aren't on there following other cabins because we're hoping to stay there though. Certainly I'm sure some of us do stay there, but yeah. the reality is we're all trying to find weekends just to go to our own cabin. So totally. we're following these other ones to connect with other people who are in this world with us. And so we actually, I think at the end of the day, care a little bit less about the cabin and the beautiful pictures than we do about the experience of hosting, building, decorating, whatever project you're in the middle of at that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's, on that note, why don't okay. you introduce yourself to folks who don't know you and tell us a little bit, you can introduce Cam too, or we can have him introduce himself when he comes oh. back, but. Uh, I'm Lauren. I am one of the co-founders of Fort Treehouse Company and Cam, my partner who will be here soon. He is the other co-founder and our lead builder. Um, and yeah, we build tree houses in tr Ontario. So take me back to like what first prompted this for you two, because tree houses is like another level of cabin, right? Like you have yeah. cabins, but really cabins are just like a unique version of a house, which we all build and own or rent. But a tree house is like something different. Was there a specific moment that the two of you realized you were on the same page about pursuing something like this? Or did you stay in a tree house? What started it? So Cam, oh, I can hear him coming upstairs. Cam started it he has had like this dream to build tree houses since he was young it was always just like a passion of his total side hobby like he's been into building forever but it was always kind of in the back of his mind to build tree houses and here he is did, did arlo go to sleep he will. um we're just explaining how the tree Hi there. Nice. <laughs> um, nice to meet you yeah you as well you want to introduce yourself yeah okay. officially Ooh, yeah, not a breath <laughs> Sorry, listeners, we have a tiny human who uh, needed us for a minute there. The tree houses, the inception of building tree houses started sure. with Cam being super excited about building with found materials and objects mm. from a very young age. Um, and then how many years ago was it? Like a decade ago, he found a 2014. Yeah, a sustainable tree house building course in Vermont and went and took that and do you want to yeah I here? could take over from there sure <laughs> um so yeah it was in uh Yestermoral is the school it's a, a sustainable uh design and build school in Waitsfield Vermont and after all these years I, I grew up um uh with a cottage about three hours north of Toronto in Canadian cabin <laughs> is that what you call it in Canada <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Yeah. Cottages. That's right. So yeah, we call it cottage country in, in Ontario. And um, so we'd pull pieces out of the local uh, burn pile and build forts and tree forts and stuff with friends of ours at the cottage. So that was maybe what Lauren was uh, explaining about early childhood. And then when I found out there was a treehouse school, um, of course I had to go. So I went to this course, um, intensive course, and really focused on the idea or, or really brought forth the idea for me of being able to build larger structures, homes effectively in the trees because of this um, hardware that's been created over the years and developed and uh, the ability to build within trees. And it's actually funny, I met one of our neighbors. We have a new property we purchased recently and uh, just met one of our neighbors. He's not up year round. He was up and said, well, how are you guys gonna build tree houses using trees for support uh, we we built they built the stand he's a hunter and they built the tree stand and he said within two years the trees had ripped it apart and so that really is how um we get into this idea of this specialized tree hardware and ensuring that the trees are allowed to move as they naturally would while the structure stays put and that's the key component is the trees still have to be able to do their thing they have to be able to grow and move and do everything as they naturally would Okay, this just got way more complicated than I thought yeah, it. So 
what? the question, <laughs> the, the initial question was, why are we building tree houses and not just like regular cabins on the ground? So we started, but sure, this sure. is great. Sure. I mean, I wasn't here it, for the question. Also, so it no, but this is fascinating. But also kind of how we clicked on the idea. So really just to fast forward a little bit here, Cam was the tree house that was in his brain for many, many years. And I was always like, cool, cool, cool. That sounds interesting. But it wasn't until like 2018 that all, all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, I love like really beautiful structures and cabins and kind of this lifestyle that we've come to know as our own in the woods. Like, let's build something together that creates that whole experience. And then I was like, oh, we could build tree houses. We could build really cool tree houses. And that's kind of how it started. Yeah. And we started designing this one that we're in and then basically like begged anyone who would listen to like help us get moving and yeah we pulled it off okay I, people, uh you can't do that well and that's what I'm wondering because kind of like that guy telling you basically yeah. like you can't do this I've tried it on a small scale and it didn't work I love this idea that you were like no I'm just gonna learn how we make this work instead of that flat no because I feel like that happens so much with anyone trying to create a unique build yeah. the first instinct whether it's from the builder the designer whoever is like, no, 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 that's too expensive. That's too hard. Yeah. So our biggest hindrance was not like the builder or the designer. Cause we kind of cam had the, the base knowledge that was required for the foundation of building a structure and trees. And really once you have the foundation, which is your platform, you can do any traditional build on top of it. Um, so it was actually like the municipal level, like bylaw level, like all of that. That was our biggest challenge, I would say, right? Getting through, and it still is our biggest Sure, challenge. it still is. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, when it comes to zoning, across the board, tree houses are unique when it comes to any official body, right? So you want to talk building inspectors, uh, bylaws, insurance, banks, financing, any of that stuff, they hear tree house, and it's like, well, this isn't not really a thing yeah so uh that that's been a challenge across the board but i mean that's why we built this in the first place we felt we needed a proof of concept because when we say yeah. tree house, people think what what you would you, uh, you know a children's tree house so we felt we had to build something to show and that's really helped us because people come and see it and you know the, the first insurance company that that uh insured the tree house they had to come to see it and they're like oh you know, and they're like, well, what if somebody falls off of the deck? And like, well, it's got code compliant guards that are at the same height as any second story of a house. Like, so oh, how no. is this any different than the other houses that you had? And that's what, but they couldn't get past the fact that it was a tree house. But then they started to get their, their head around the fact that, okay, we, we need to apply the same thing we would to any other home. It happens to be attached to trees, but right. at the end of the day, it's code compliant, engineered stamps. It's no different from any other custom build. This is very similar to the trend right now of container homes. And we've talked to some folks who build those, but it's the same idea that like the world of building and cabins or any kind of unique design is moving so quickly. And these older institutions like insurance, local permitting, um, banks financing it haven't quite caught up to what this is and don't understand it enough. How did you approach the financing side? Did you just pay for it up front because you were able to build it? So it was really just cost of materials because who... Would you have the same problem with a bank understanding the value of something like that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and and no, we didn't pay for it outright. We we scraped together what we could, and then we uh, we really went everywhere we could to to try to find the money to finance it and, and to convince people that it was in fact a good idea. Because before it was built, it was still an idea that people were a little uncomfortable with. Once it was built, I think, and and we've had some people who helped us. Um, we were fortunate to have the support of some of our. We have. Um, like uh, community development corporations in all the small towns uh, in, up here. And, and so our local uh, um, center was able to help us out with a loan. We had federal funding that we got. They helped us get like a bunch of grants, actually, like innovative grant building grants to get like a large wow. fee for this. They, we would not be here without them. No. Wait, free done. money. This isn't even a loan. Grants are yeah. like... Yeah, free money is our favorite. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of free money too. Yeah. Um, and so the whole, it's it's powered by solar. So, you know, green energy innovation are, are big things at, at the federal level in Canada. So um, those kind of fit into some of the grants they had available. So from grant money, loans, and then, you know, and we ran out of money at a point because, our, you know, we budgeted 
what, 100,000 and ended up costing 300,000. And then COVID hit. And then COVID hit. So that bumped it up a little more. Yep. Um, but <laughs> it, it just, and, and I, I mean, attribute Lauren to much of our success because I'm the type of person who likes to plan things out, ensure that I have everything in place before I execute. And Lauren's kind of the, the dreamer, yeah, big like, ideas person. Just like, oh, we just got to keep just going. And, and sure enough, you know, I, I still remember we, we, I was like, how are we, we need more money. We, we ran out. <laughs> and I was, you know, working on, on some of the, the main, uh, like carry beams for the treehouse and what am I going to do? And I get a call from uh, a, a bank that I don't even bank with. And they're like, we'd like to offer you an unsecured line of credit. <laughs> 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 we're like okay <laughs> so scam calls so, and it just somehow it just kept to kept working out so we we, yeah. we, we really I, I don't and so i've gone into this next project to which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit but with a little bit of a different lens where i'm like you know what we can make this work we're gonna we've, make it work we've out. switched so. positions a little bit like the first project i was like we got to go big this is our proof of concept we've got to find a way we can't cut corners this is going to be our showpiece it has to be like as grand as we can make it. And now this next one, I'm like, oh my God, it's like four to four or five times bigger than this. And I am very nervous. <laughs> if you're dreaming about a cabin build or are in the midst of a build, or you just bought a place and are getting ready to host for the very first time, regardless of where you are, sometimes you just need a little help along the way. Shared experiences from someone who's been there advice from someone who's learned a lot of lessons the hard way that's me or a cheerleader as you finish up all of these reasons are exactly why i started offering cabin consultations to our instagram followers and friends who could use some specific one-on-one -on -one help i can't promise to solve all your problems but i can promise to be transparent about our build costs and process our organization and project management systems our favorite and least favorite tools for renting how we market, and how we found ourselves with almost 80,000 Instagram followers and 100% occupancy in our first year of hosting at Cozy Rock. So if that sounds like it might help you, feel free to visit us at staycozycabin.com or on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin and sign up for a time to chat there. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get there because I definitely want to talk about that, but I don't want to just skim past this first one because I think it's so impressive that you built it yourself. And how did you, did you have the skills already, Cam, or did you have to teach yourself some of these skills? Cause you went to the course, did that teach yeah. you everything you needed to know in order no. to build it? So I, um, years back at, um, the early two thousands, I started in, um, carpentry. So I did hardwood flooring. I did uh, cabinetry, fine furniture making. Okay. Kitchen. And then I got into renovations. So I, I certainly had some skills. I'd never done a ground up build. And I should say, I mean, we did a lot of it uh, on our own. We still had help along the way, of course. Uh, a good friend of ours has a construction company in the area and, and he, him and his crew helped us frame it. So that was huge. Um, but beyond that, there was a lot of learning. So yeah, I, I certainly had some skills when it comes to carpentry, but obviously with the ground up build, there's a lot more than just carpentry involved. And yeah. so we called in, we, we subbed out, you know, plumbing, electrical, uh, yeah. um, HVAC, any of that kind of stuff you do. Um, uh, but it, I, I learned a lot and, 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 and I'm continuing to learn. I think that's part of what draws me to this type of work and why I left my full-time job to focus on this solely because that's what I thrive on. I thrive on learning and, and, and yeah. knowing myself. I really like to learn new skills and, and, uh, and continue kind of challenging myself there. And Cam can figure everything out. He, you know, people can learn things and figure things out, but Cam will learn it to the absolute best possible way mm. you can learn something. And so it takes more time. And sometimes that can be challenging for me, but I'm learning <laughs> that it's like better to do it right once. This is exactly what Sean and I get into. He'll be working on a project. I'm like, this doesn't need to be perfect. We just need it to get done. And he's like, I'm not half-assing it. I'm going to do it correctly. And I'm like, okay. It is, it is worth it in the end. It's just real construction is a hard, it is like not for the faint of heart and I'm borderline faint of heart. So mm. it can be very challenging to be in these projects that take a really long time yeah. before you see the result of like, how cool it's going to be. You know? I know you have to have that vision, but alongside the vision, you have to have confidence. So I'm yeah. curious, Lauren, I want you to speak to Cam's confidence first, and then I'll ask you, but like, 
did like, has he always had the confidence to be like, I can just leave my full-time job and do this thing that I've never done before and be completely certain that it's going to work out. Like that just feels like such a leap. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not at all. Um, I think we've kind of role reversed a little bit. Like I always had the confidence. I always had like the big kind of big ideas, big dreams, big, like we could do this. We could, we're going to do this. We've got to make this work. And, um, I think that kickstarted this project and, but Cam has kind of really stepped in and followed through with like the confidence we need now to keep going because we're now in like, and I don't want to like jump ahead again, but we're now in this like massive second project, which is so amazing and so exciting, but it is also very scary and um, has been incredibly confident and like steadfast in keeping that moving when things are like wall after wall after wall. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, whoa, I'm just going to turn, I'm just going to walk away now, you know, and we can't do that. Cam, did that come from the successful first build? Because I'm sure it probably was scarier at first, but you all have clearly knocked it out of the park with the Baltic. So did that help? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that went a long way. And I think, I mean, at this point, I've, I've done it. So we're hustling now and the only way is, uh, is through and, and, and up. So, um, I think a lot of my confidence comes in that. I feel like there's always a way to, to figure out how mm-hmm. to make it work. And mm-hmm. so if I can keep that mentality, mm-hmm. then, uh, I think we can, uh, we can do some pretty amazing things. So, okay. So take me, this is a good point. I think for us to go to the next project, take me to the next project, what you're currently working on. Um, yeah, we're building like a small tree house. We don't know what to call it yet. Like it feels weird to call it a hotel. It feels weird to call it like an inn it's or like a, a lodge. Like a lodge. Yeah. So we built like a ground level lobby and then we're building three very large tree houses to go along with it. Um, and that's kind of like our phase one of this project. So we bought another property, it's 15 acres, um, but it's right next to a 500 acre nature reserve. Oh. And trails actually walk right from our property, can walk right into this nature reserve. There's a beautiful river that flows through it. It's it's really cool and it's really special and we have a long way to go. <laughs> Okay, but the search for land is like often the hardest part and the biggest deal maker. Year and a half long process. It was a long process. And we also like to go back to financial stuff. We got after the success of the Baltic, you know, we had like um, a handful of like big money investor types approaching us. And, you know, one person stood out as like a great opportunity. And we went through like the motions, probably like, six months in talks with this guy um, working 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 with him to like you know build out our model for our next plans and everything was like going and going and going and we just got this like we got to like this final big moment and it just didn't feel right you know and we were just Mm -hmm. like we can't nothing was lining up properly for us based on like what had kind of been like promised their role would be versus what our role would be. And so right at like the final moment, we were like, nope, we're going to do this ourselves. And so we ended ended there, (laughs) found another property that was much smaller than we had been looking. We were like, we need, we were like, we need a hundred acres. We're going to build this massive thing, you know, and like big money behind us. And so we pumped the brakes on that, found our property. And actually, I think it wor- couldn't, nothing could have worked yeah, out better than that. We felt like a giant weight had been lifted. We weren't ready to go that big. Um, you know, this, this next step feels like a big one for us, but it's just for us, you know, and yeah. then there, if that goes really well, and we decide we still want to do like, you know, 10 unit treehouse hotel 20 like if we do feel like we still want to go there then this will kind of put us in a better stratosphere for working with people like that it certainly changes the endurance when it's your heart that's in it and if there's someone else involved even if they're a really good partner it's still not the same as it being just for you yeah exactly yeah. So, okay. You know, yeah. We're, it's great. Everything is everything we've done, everything we've worked towards. It's been really, really hard because now it's been a year that we've been going, we're still trying to get our final zoning to be able to build the tree houses. 
we will get it. We're at the very final moment, but it was almost 18 months of since we applied. Just like meetings with the towns, having to present your plans, present your case. Getting them yeah. to vote. Different studies. Environmental yeah, like studies, environmental impact yeah. studies. Like we've done it all, which is really cool and really great. It's just the process is painfully slow. So at what point in the first one, because you have said when you talked about the first one, you knew all along this was your proof of concept, which tells me that it was never just like we're building one. You always knew there was going to be something afterwards. How long did it take you after launching that first one to know, okay, we're ready? What was that timeline like between the Baltic and the next stage? Yeah. And I mean, it, it's everything changed because we built this as a proof of concept with the idea that our, our business was going to be building these for other people. So this was a, this was a show. Oh, the whole <laughs> rental thing was. Oh, that's really so different. Yeah. We thought, we thought, oh, you know what? We'll rent this so we can, to, you know, to pay for it, but we're going to build for other people. And as soon as we were almost through building this, we were getting crazy amounts. It was like, uh, to be fair though, the, the major dream was always a treehouse hotel, right. but the construction company was going to get us there. Which also yeah. makes sense for Cam leaving his job because construction is so like, if you build one good one, you know, and you only need yeah. one or two a year or maybe one a year to fund that. So it's like less scary than immediately yeah. going to hotel job right away wasn't it you didn't leave your no, job in fact, until... I, we built this i was still working full-time lauren was nine months pregnant by the time we were just to the and i was working full-time until covid hit and then i had to look after our son because he didn't have daycare anymore you both were working full-time while you started this build and you yeah. were pregnant. It, was, it was evenings and yeah. weekends yeah so uh, i yeah. was like days away from giving birth when we fought we did our final photo shoot for airbnb in this tree <laughs> like our photographer was here we were there was still like pieces of siding on the back that weren't on and like our original airbnb photos you can see that things are not finished <laughs> But that was the, I was like, we're going to have a baby. This is the only time we have to like get these photos done. And anyways, we're going off on a tangent here, but yeah. So it was a, it was like a year, not a year later. Well, we started, so we started renting the Baltic October, 2020. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I guess it was February of 2022 that we purchased the property. So, and that was over a year of, of looking yeah. for properties. And, you know, like you said, finding a property is very difficult. We had the additional challenge of not only finding the perfect property, but the perfect trees. We're looking for a specific species of tree, but also size of tree. And then also trees that are in proximity to one another, we can put a, a tree house in it. So, you know, we'd be like, this is the perfect property. If we walk, it's a hundred acres or walking. It's like, but there's no hardwood. Uh, or we'd be like, these trees are unreal. They're perfect. It's like, but there's no municipal access to yeah, the property. So we're not actually going to be able to build on it. So, you know, it, it really threw a loop because even when we thought we'd found a good property, it still wasn't a good property. So the, the search went on. So this one, this one just, it, it worked out so beautifully. It's funny. This, our real estate agent, um, put us on to this property that we ended up buying. And then when we were walking the properties he said oh and the, the one next door 20 acres next door just sold as well and we're like oh do you know who bought it he's like yeah i did <laughs> so 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 our, our our agent bought the property next door and he is he's great and he happened to be the executive director of the community development corporation that helped us uh he had retired we actually uh, started working on financing with them but he was the first person we pitched the idea to so it's kind of came full circle and he helped us find property and then fortunately as our neighbor he fully supported the project which is which is so helpful because as your agent and then also the part where we made an offer on the property and the owners came back and they said no to our initial offer and then how much then we needed sixty thousand more dollars sixty five thousand sixty five thousand and we were like ah oh, like we were like we had no investor we only had what we had and this real estate agent our neighbor he loaned us the money really believed so much he, he in our project courage, yeah yeah and we've already so paid that, him. Yeah. yeah okay so he really believed in it not just yeah. like he was putting his money where his mouth was yeah, yeah. yeah. isn't that so nice like that's this, awesome it's we've been so supported by this small community yeah so how far is this from the original treehouse uh half an hour but it's the same township okay 
<laughs> it is just crazy to me as someone looking for land right now that you found 15 acres that borders 500 acres of protected land with the right trees and the right neighbors. Like, this is just crazy to me. And trails are out for skiing, snowshoeing, hiking, biking, like, yeah. and, and it can never be developed. It's it's uh, part of an eco gifts program. So it, it can never be developed. It's Which is so important because land can look one way when you go. And then if someone buys a lot across the street or behind you or whatever, it changes everything. And Lauren, the skiing is probably pretty good for you since you're now a, what is it? A Olympic um, marathon skier <laughs> or on your way. You're on your I way. Wish. God, no, I'm too old for that. Um, but no, I love skiing. Yeah. So now you have personally a place where you can go and like clean the cabins and then just go out skiing. I don't know if you all do the cleaning, but go check on the cabins and then go for a long ski. Oh, yeah, right. We'll be t doing all kinds of things with these cabins. I'm sure we'll just be like living there and making sure everything's running. It's going to be a whole other ball game. I mean, you have multiple rentals, so we only have one right now. It's going to be such a game changer adding three more. Are you going to have though, because you have a lobby and it's going to be sort of like a treehouse hotel, are you going to have staff for it? Or is it just going to be the two of you? We will, we, you know, we'll figure it out kind of, we'll open it up and we'll obviously be like the primary ones there for the first while while we get things going off the ground, but we do have plans to hire like a site manager. Okay. And that'll take a lot of that work yeah. off of your plate, which will be great. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. Okay, Cam, I have an important question for you that I have just been waiting for the right person to ask this of because <laughs> one of one of my personal pet peeves is this sudden surge of tree houses, but you look at them and they're just like built <laughs> on a platform and you're like, wait a minute, this is an elevated house. This is not a tree house. So how would you define what truly makes something a tree house versus a house on stilts? Well, this is, I have, I have, I have an opinion on this, but also I want to preface that by saying that, um, so we've been to what's called the World Trios Conference in Oregon. So there are people from have. all over the world. Yeah. And they come in, it, incredible. People from Japan, Brazil, for, I mean, in the States, as you probably know, there are incredible amount of treehouse specific builders in, in the States. But in Canada, there are uh, None. one other that I know yeah. of in, in Quebec that specifically builds tree houses. Um, and so anyways, we went to this conference and the old guard, the, the people who have been building tree houses for 30 years plus, some of them have a feeling that a, a tree house is only truly a tree house if it's only supported by trees. So I, I, I personally feel as though that's, that's wonderful, but I also, and, and maybe using the Baltic as an example, feel as though it's nice for anybody and everybody to have access to whatever a tree house is to them. Mm. And, and it's a feeling, you know, when you're in a tree house, you're in the trees, there's a feeling that you get and, and it's magical. And so on the, on our property, um, our personal property is three acres. We only had so many trees, but we wanted to build this. So we said, well, these are the trees that can support it, but they can't fully support it. So we're going to put some posts over here. But when you're in here, I mean, someone's coming up the stairs, you feel it shift a bit. When you're out on the deck, the trees are still going through the deck, through the roof. It truly feels like a tree house. So uh, I guess my feeling is uh, if it's in a forest, in the trees, it gives you that sensation of being in a tree house and in the forest, then, you know, I, I think it's fair for, for people to call it a tree house if, if they'd like. I mean, from my standpoint, the whole piece of this that I really like and, and find the challenge in is the fact that we are building in trees, that we have to be very careful through the construction process not to uh, do anything to disturb the, the, the roots of the trees, the mm -hmm. land surrounding it. So when we're building, we're bringing things in by hand, we're lifting things up using rigging and, and not using big machines. So there's a style of building, and this is gonna take me completely off topic, but we built this ground level lobby at a new property. It's traditional construction, there's a foundation, and there's a, I mean, you've done you've done a build, there's a certain amount of devastation, let's call it, that comes mm -hmm. with construction, and that's mm -hmm. just the way it is. Yep. Uh, but something that we feel really, really uh, important, and, and, and I guess something that kind of drives us in, in the builds that we're doing, is that we can put up a structure in the middle of the woods, trees still all surrounding it that survive. And that feels yeah. so cool to be able to do that because we took down way more trees than we wanted to 
at our new property and we're able to use them for firewood for wood chips that we need to do to protect the the roots of the trees we're building in uh, and and to mill up for lumber for building wood sheds and things so it's it's great there's a use for them but it's still a very different style of construction so to your original question mm -hmm. i think a treehouse is whatever you know somebody wants it to be i think if someone calls it a treehouse and, and they're renting it and someone comes and stays in it and they don't get a feeling of it being a treehouse then it's probably not a treehouse this is so funny that your answer is so much more supportive. You building them, and I'm the one who's snobby, and I'm like, no, this is not a treehouse. So I'm and just, I'm, I'm team snobby too. Okay. Um, and I'm not opposed to a house on stilts. Just call it, really it what it is. It makes it really challenging for people to, and I get it. Treehouse was like the number one Airbnb thing that people were looking for a couple of years ago, or maybe still. I have no idea, but it's impossible to really find them now because there's so many that use that. Right. And so I think that in, from, from like a rental standpoint, if you really want like an authentic treehouse experience, there's no checkbox for that. The ones that are actually built in trees. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the only thing, right? Like pre-supported house. Yes. Yeah. And it takes so much more time, intentionality, even just the training cam that you had to put in to learn how to do it in the trees. So there is, I, that's why I feel like I would feel snobby about it if it were me, just because you put in all this time to do it in this really authentic, I don't know if that's the right word for this, but like genuine way that yeah. someone else can just, you know, throw a cabin up on, you know, a platform and it can be considered in the same ca category is just, it doesn't mean I don't like them. I've stayed in one and I loved it. It was a great experience. It's more, I just thought to myself the whole time, I was like, this is great. I love this place. Is it really a tree house though? It's like what I thought to myself. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys, Sean here, host of Chelle. The dreaded mud season of Vermont is finally drying out, which means it's time for all the spring and summer activities you've been missing out on this winter. And what better place to stretch the legs and breathe in some green mountain air than Southern Vermont. Let me share with you my usual routine when I pack a bag and head to the A for the weekend. First things first, roll the windows down and let the fresh air in. I don't know what it is, but for some reason you can feel and smell when you cross the Vermont state line from Massachusetts. What's a road trip without a coffee and a pastry though, so before you make the turn up the big hill into the farmland, pull over at Shelburne Falls Coffee. Next, enjoy the winding two-lane drive up and over the mountain and through the small Vermont towns with a podcast or your favorite playlist on. If you're hungry, make a pit stop at American Flatbread in West Dover for a slice of za and some local Vermont beer. One final stop to grab a bottle of wine and some cheese and a few supplies at the general store and 10 minutes later, you're pulling off the paved road onto the gravel right away that leads you up to Chalet. With the car in park, I hop out with a big stretch, toss my bag inside and kick back in one of the chairs on the deck to enjoy the last bit of sun before it sets. With some snacks and a glass of wine, I toss on my most recent audiobook and light the fire pit and let my mind wander as the sun sets before tucking into bed for the night. But by far, my favorite thing is to wake up early as the sun is rising and sit on the front deck with a hot cup of coffee as fog and dew burns off the grass and out of the woods. With the whole day ahead, it's just tough to decide between hiking, biking, paddling, fishing, or exploring by car, all the fun spots we have just 10 minutes from the A. If this sounds like your kind of trip, hop on over to the booking link in the show notes or shoot us any questions you might have about the area. Okay, back to the show. And you know what we get a lot from our guests too, which I think is just what makes it special. Treehouse or not treehouse, but when people arrive and they see like the grandeur of like, everybody's like, whoa, this is like way more impressive in real life, which is like mm. what you always want, right? You yeah. never want to go somewhere and be like, huh, this looked better online, <laughs> you know? So people come I and totally they're like, agree. Wow. because where they enter, they kind of enter from their driveway and walk through a path in the woods and they enter like under the treehouse. And you can see these like massive tree hardware and supports. And so I think everybody is just kind of like, holy smokes, like you can't really get a sense of how it's built from the photos online. Although the photos online are pretty good. That's one of the things I made note of as someone who works full time in a visual industry, your photos are really nice. So if it still yeah. looks better in person, then I can't even imagine. I, I mean, I don't know if it looks better in person. It, it, 
certainly looks as good as, but I think people don't realize how large it is. Yeah. Like, I think it like, it's like when you're below it and looking up, it's like pretty chunky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, cause your pictures do a really good job of showing it in the trees, which obviously is the appeal of tree houses. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Cam is like this beautiful part of not having to take down as many trees, which was my least favorite part of the build. And so mm -hmm. they hide it a little bit, which is kind of cool. Cause it makes you feel like you're truly in the trees, which is why you want to go to a tree house. But on yeah. that visual note, I know Lauren, you do a lot of the design. Do you do the photography as well? Or is that all professionals that you bring in? I do some of it. I have a background in photography, but okay. like you, you're a professional videographer and you still are like, I don't know, for me, it's more like, I'm just going to be so picky about my own personal work that sometimes it's easier to just hire people. Yeah. So when we start, I totally agree. When we started the build, we started working with this awesome team of guys. Actually, it was like one of my brother's really good friends and he has a content marketing company. And he kind of was the one who said, you got to start a social media page. You got to start like an Instagram page, like right from the get go. And I was like, but why? Like we haven't built anything yet. And he's like, yeah, but that doesn't matter. You need to start building your brand and your brand is you. I was like, no, 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 no. We can't do that. And then, you know, so he encouraged us along. So the first like year while we were building, he would come and the first sh shoot we did, we had nothing. We had like our trees selected yeah. and we, we had the hardware and we were kind of just introducing ourselves and our lifestyle. And it was like, that was so nerve wracking. And that was like, so scary to start that way. But it, it was truly like, he helped us build our business in a big yeah. way, the very beginning. <laughs> storytelling is so much about like marketing is so much about the storytelling. And in your case, because you are actually the ones building it, I'm like scrolling your Instagram right now as, as you're telling me about this, so I can see these visuals and I see pictures of Cam, like actually building it. And that happens in so few cabin builds, right? Like so many of it you're outsourcing. So that is a really unique part of your story. Yes, and you did so a really good that. job of documenting it. <laughs> These pictures yeah, are amazing. Yeah, yeah, we did. And our friends at Bellwether, Alan and Chris, they've been amazing. Um, but since it's been built, I've really struggled with how to capture it. Um, we've had like influencers come through. We've had we've had other photographers come through and that, that's been great. But like, like I never get like biggest beef with, and I know you've talked about this a lot on here and I don't want to like make anybody upset, but like, <laughs> Doing trades for stays has never been a good idea for us. Really? Never, unfortunately. Yeah, we've never. Tell me more about that. Experience. Um, we get like about 500 DMs a month of people wanting to like come and like, you know, they want to post about it. And at first I was like, oh, cool. This is like so exciting. This would be really, really good. But I don't know. I've just been let down every time by like either people coming and like they'll shoot and then leave the place like a complete disaster. Like it was like a gift to them. And I'm like, Whoa, wait a second. Like you yeah. still got a free stay for two days. And, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to like really get into it. I don't want to offend anybody, but do you have any, pain, let's frame it this way. Do you have any ad is the advice? Paying people. Okay. Just paying people like, yeah. Pay pick people who you see, you see their work, you can see that they're professionals and, and pay them, pay them for their yeah. work. And it goes such a long way. And we, every time we've worked with someone that we're like, okay, we're giving you money. This is what we want in return. I do a trade. I kind of like leave them be because I feel like they're giving us something and we're giving them something. So I don't want to be like, oh, can you do this? Or can you do that? So maybe that was my problem with having less guidance. I'm trying to get a lot better at that and being like, this is what we need. This is the type of photography we need. Yep. And then also I'm just like, I can just shoot this myself. I know, I especially with the background. Yeah. I will say that's been my biggest takeaway. My best success has almost always been folks that I pay. That's been the best experience because they're true professionals. It's what they do for a living. The ones we've done a fair amount of trades and the ones that have worked out the best are when I clarify and I feel rude doing this, but I'm like, okay, if you're going to get three nights stay, that's worth this much money. Um, mm -hmm. Can you please articulate exactly what I'm getting? How many photos, how many video clips, how many reels, what is the trade that's worth that much money just so that I know the other thing I've had them a couple at our other cabin was pay the cleaning fee so then there's okay. some like 
I don't know. It just felt like, okay, that's something because they're still gonna have to clean up after you. Yeah. But no, it's great. And actually, like there have been some where I've tried to, I've been a lot better at being like, okay, what are you delivering in return? But then because posting on your own profile is not enough for me. Like there's no guarantee. I don't know who your followers are. I don't know if they're people who are interested in this. So that if you're doing that, that's fine. But in addition to delivering me content that I can do something with that I know will pay off for my marketing. Yeah. We've had a couple like random, like big YouTube cabin type people who like come and do cabin tours. And when I looked at their account where I'm like, wow, they've got like ridiculous amount of followers and they have really beautiful videos. And then like we got ours and what is like who shot this or yeah the other ones it was yeah. very different it was very different yeah so, 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 I mean whatever you live and you learn we didn't we haven't actually lost anything by it you know and it's fine well, but this a, is helpful though you yeah. know when when a lot of these people I think coming in the, and the, the trades I think correct me if I'm wrong a lot of them are posting like you said Janice to their own uh, social media. Yeah. Pla- so it's, it's their style. It's their story. Whereas when we're paying professionals, they're asking their professionals, they're asking what we want and they're delivering that through with the lens that, that we'd like versus their own story, their own style. So that is such a good point. Right? Yeah. That's really well put. Cause we had one publication that was main specific come stay and it was a trade and they had pitched it to us. And like the majority of the photos had their magazine in all of them. And it wasn't just like placed on a thing. It was like reading the magazine. And as a result, we don't use many of, there were just a handful that were of the cabin, but it was like, okay, you were here shooting this content for your purposes, which actually is totally understandable. You're building your own business. I wish I had been more clear about what I needed, but I didn't see that coming. And so that's a really good point. They're shooting for their audience. So how do you clarify what you need for your audience? Yeah, you almost need just like like a tear sheet for like everyone that messages you, right? To be like, do you fit into this? This is what I need. And if yeah, it's okay. And at the end of the day, like once you've had enough come, you have like a backlog of pictures, at least this is what we found. So I don't need it as much. So I can be really picky now. At the beginning, I felt like I needed a lot of content because I don't I don't live as close as you all do. So I needed like constant content in order to post daily. But now that we have stuff we can use, I can be a little bit pickier and I've learned from what worked and what didn't work. Totally. It's such a process. Can you tell me, Lauren, I have, okay, so normally we're introducing a new hot topics and I want to ask you about some of these, but I have so many more questions we haven't gotten to. So let me do these two more questions, one for each of you, and then maybe we'll hit a couple hot topics. Um, Lauren, you do the design and like that piece of the space and it's just gorgeous. How do you, like, I've always hired interior designers because I just find this part so intimidating to take a vision and execute it at a really high level where everything is cohesive and creates a feel. How do you, what does your process look like? Where do you start? How do you do that? I think I start with just wanting there to not be very much stuff. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I I feel like, okay, here's my problem. (laughs) And too much space is scary and overwhelming And actually this space was incredibly challenging to decorate because right when I needed to order everything, we couldn't go to any stores. We could only order stuff online. Everything was sold out. Like we couldn't back ordered anything. I basically ended up finding this cool store on the East coast of Canada and it was owned by women. And I like phoned them up and they started laying out like all of our textiles. Like I bought like all of our cushions and our rug from them and they started like matching like our bedding to things they had in their store because oh my god please tell us who they are they're called modern comfort with a k okay they're based okay yeah and they've been so awesome like they and and then we had like something happen to our first rug so we were like can you help us can you get this rug for us again because it just fits so well in our space and then they gave us like 50 percent off so we've sent like tons of people have bought this rug based on seeing it in the Baltic. I think what happened was we had a very small space and so we needed to pick like our key pieces. So we needed to get a couch that was gonna fit in a not traditional couch size space. So that was our first challenge. So once we found like our this dark brown chocolate leather couch, everything was kind of built around that. Okay, so what I'm hearing is pick like the hardest constraint to fit 
fill <laughs> that first yeah. and then start building around that in terms of design like your, and space. Your bare minimum pieces, right? So you know you're going to need somewhere to sit. Our other thing was we knew we were going to have these wood walls. So that takes, that's like a big statement piece, right? Like having wood plywood on your walls. It, yes. It doesn't feel like it is, but it is like, it's, it's a color you don't want to mess with. You can't like throw like a light brown couch next to those walls. And then we couldn't have hardwood floors because that would be too much wood. And then like, yeah, so we kind of just worked backwards from the things that we knew we were going to have. And the other thing, the other piece with these tree houses is just like big windows. Everything you need is outside the windows. I know. Kind of like the idea, right? It's like everything, the bare minimum of what you need is inside so that you can be comfortable and everything else is out there. You just, you don't need much. So our guests have everything they need and nothing more. And the big windows do a lot of work for you, both in terms of lights, you need less like additional lighting, whether it's floor lamps or hanging lamps or whatever, because during the day that does everything. And it just naturally leaves less walls that you have to fill with art or things. And you all somehow have made plywood look like artwork. So you don't, I would almost feel weird, like putting holes in it. It looks so good that that has done some of the work for you too, is just picking the right materials in the right places lessens the need for more things to like make it look good for sure yeah yeah and I mean I think we learned a lot too in this space like go with our new tree houses I'm sure we'll do things a little bit differently but we probably still will stick with the plywood walls and again like because they're small spaces and this time we're actually working with like a full team of architects so we have like even smarter people on our next build so they're (laughs) going to be really really cool um but everything has its own place like you know like you can't really mess around with like crazy amounts of extra stuff because it's just like the couches are going to be built in the kitchen will all be built in like the table will be built in the beds will be built in there's not much room for more yeah okay i was just thinking about the plywood when it comes to material choices it's another consideration of building in a tree house okay. it's, it's always going to move slightly you don't really feel this building move um, but from a construction standpoint, you know, we use screws instead of nails. We have tie downs and, and, and certain hardware that you'd use in seismic zones because it's going to move o- over time. And so drywall, for, an, for example, uh, you'd have screws popping all over the place because it's going to shift. There's going to be torsion in, the, in the, the box itself. So drywall is not a great option for a tree house. So this was so. a functional choice that just happens to look really good as well. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there was one cabin on season one of the Cabin Chronicles. I don't know if you watch it, but the inside was like all plywood. And it was the first time I saw that and was like, wow, this is a really distinct look. That's also beautiful. And then I saw yours, but theirs was definitely not function. So I think it's really interesting that this is actually like a functional material choice too. I mean, we, the other big thing for us was we wanted this space to be very like natural, you know, all because we're building in trees, it felt right to use things that were like wood and our mm-hmm. floors are made out of like this sand and clay mixture. It's an earthen floor. So it looks like concrete, but it's not. So just very like earthy materials. And actually you can really like feel it. I think if you were in this space and we had white walls and like a tradition, more traditional sort of building interior design. I don't know that it would feel the same way. Yeah. It would change. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to totally do a 180. Cam, you were described. I don't know if Lauren filled out the form or you did, but we're described as the CFO of the team. And I jokingly refer to myself as the CFO of our household on a daily basis. And so just let's get a little bit nerdy for one second, um, because all of us who are managing rentals, someone in the house is doing the financial side. Are there any tools that really like make your life easier or like what financial recommendations would you have, especially as you're growing to more properties? Cause that's a big jump for a lot of folks. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, number one would be find a good accountant. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's something we didn't do off the bat. I was trying to do everything myself and I, I have a good head for numbers and, and, and financials, but not so much for taxes and the intricacies that, that come with that. 
So um, I still do our bookkeeping, but we have a team of accountants to, to handle because we have multiple businesses now and should have done that earlier. So that would be the main thing. You're starting a business, get an accountant, get a yeah. lawyer. Um, those things are expensive, but so important and help you so much in the long run. Um, we use QuickBooks. You know, there's lots of different software out there. I don't really know one from the next. I just a new QuickBooks. And so I've, I've learned it. And it, it's nice because I can do uh, the bookkeeping and then our accountants can take that. You know, it's all online. So it's nice and simple. I'm not trying to scramble for things to send to them. They can go and see the work I've done there. Um, How in the weeds do you get with your bookkeeping? Do you go like item by item or do you let QuickBooks do most, most of it and just give it like a once over every now and then? No, I go and I, I leave it for way too long <laughs> and then I hunker down for weeks and go yeah. all line by line. And then I get about 17 emails. What's this? What's this charge? <laughs> this charge happens in our house. September. Yeah. Yeah. I do it every month, but my sister who co-owns one of the houses with us and Sean both get like, a t they know exactly what I'm doing bookkeeping because it's just one text after another of like, what's this expense? What's this Venmo payment? What's, what's GWX <laughs> super filter Insta yeah. <laughs> for $11? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I needed that. <laughs> Of course. Marketing. This is what I tell Sean every time we're at the cabin and he's doing manual labor and I'm on my phone. He's like, get off your phone. And I'm like, I'm marketing. This is real work. Just like those filters. Yep. Okay. So you get in the weeds with it. You go like, uh, like line. Yeah. I, yeah. And I have, I think that's, that's how my, my, I, I have maybe, I guess it's unfortunate in some ways and it's unfortunate in other ways, but I, I have a, a need for things to be complete. So um, I can't, I can't let things go. I have to ensure that I feel that I, I've got everything in order. Um, so yeah, QuickBooks, the accountant, those things all great. And aside from that, I do a lot of my you know projections and things. I'm working in Excel and it's a powerful tool, but there's a lot to learn. Um, I'm still learning as I go, but that's kind of helped us in taking, you know, the Baltic was so great because we built this proof of concept and it's a, a building, a structure, a business, a rental, but it also provided us with so much information uh, when it comes to uh, the cost of building, the cost to run a rental, that, you know, all of these things that are very hard. You can Google any of these things online. And what I've found is the information online is drastically different from reality. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yes. I was like, yeah, this is what, you know, I, I found like three articles online. They all had about the same number. And then the oh number my God, that Dwell great. magazine with the recent budgets, that cannot be right. <laughs> I didn't oh, see that. Oh my God. They did a whole uh, magazine on like breaking down actual costs. And I was like, man, things must be way cheaper in the States, but because that could, would no. never accurate in Canada. No, I mean, I do think it's a little, Pete is always telling me, Pete's our designer who's from Canada and he's always telling me yeah. that prices are different in Canada, but yeah. I mean, it's not cheap in the States. So I can't imagine whenever I watch Maine cabin masters, I just get infuriated. I like love it because it's in Maine, but I get so mad at the cost of the build. Cause I'm just like, you are deceiving thousands of people into thinking that this oh. is like really affordable when it's just not. <laughs> Oh, and it is hard because I think people think this is a great idea. I want to do this. They go find a builder. Builder gives them a price that's likely a fair price. And say, that's ridiculous. But the cost of building is very expensive. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, whether you're north of the border or south, I think it's, uh, you know, it's increased just in the time since we built this. It's 30% more than it was. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and the other and challenge. Is oh, go ahead. Things things have normalized a bit outside of COVID, but prices are never going to drop back to what they were. So no. No. And I think as the market gets more saturated in 2020, a ton of people bought into us to short-term rentals, at least here in the States. And so standing out is becoming even harder, which means putting more effort into like mm -hmm. stuff that you're doing, Lauren, the design and building cool experiences, all are going to make it even pricier and yeah. figuring out how either pricier or more time consuming. Cause I do think it can be done really cool. If you put in the labor and you source all of your own stuff via like Facebook marketplace or thrift stores, things like that can be done, but it's so wildly time consuming that it's like one oh, or the other. That amaze me. Pull off cool design by piecing things like that is a true art form. I agree. 
that's my dream for our next cabin, but I can't figure out exactly how we're going to pull it off being here in North Carolina and then building in Maine and, and creating a, a, like a high level design that I feel good about not knowing what you're going to find at the local thrift store, the local flea market or Facebook marketplace. Like, I don't know how people do that. I'm going to try, but we'll see how it goes. Stay tuned. I think if you can give yourself like a fair window of time and not feel rushed, then you could probably pull off something seriously cool. Yeah. You know? That's, that is the beauty of a build is that yeah. you have, I, and unlike you all, we didn't build ours. My cousin built it. So I had like a trusted person building it, but I was here in North Carolina on my computer every night doing all the other pieces of it. So it did give us time. Let's close out with just a couple hot topics. I want to see where you stand on them. These are things that consistently come up in cabin consultations and messages on Instagram and podcasts. So I have a whole huge list of them. I'm going to pick three and just see where you stand. Okay. Let's start with cameras in a rental. Where do you stand on this? Oh, like, oh, I see. I was like, what do you mean? Um, Well, cameras like cameras, uh, uh, security cameras. Security cameras in a rental. Inside? Either. Inside, Uh, outside. What are your thoughts? We have one outside. Um, and it's mo- it's not even really, it's not even pointed at the treehouse. It's kind of a nondescript. We can see people entering, not even the front door, kind of like coming to the bottom of the stairs. And it's more just like for a safety thing. I think it's totally fine to have those. Yeah. And people are aware. It's We don't say there's no camera here. It's yeah. not. Yeah, people are aware that it's there. Like, transparent that there is a camera on site. And people still try to bring extra people, despite knowing that. Which is crazy to me, because that's part of the reason, as you can see, are they bringing pets if we're not pet friendly? Are you bringing the right amount of people? For us, we use the outdoor cameras just to check on like weather. Okay, we know it's supposed to snow. Is it enough snow that we need the plow guys to come? Is it like, what does the weather conditions look like? Have they come? Has our cleaner come? Just so I can know that everything's running on track. Yeah. No, and we we do that too. And and I think, I mean, we're, we're not far away but if we are so we go away for christmas i come back if we get a big snowstorm we might have a snowstorm where we are but not necessarily at the tree so that's what i'll do check the tree right the snow gotta go back so yeah clear the snow um so it's helpful for practical reasons but i think also for security reasons and then also for the the very the 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 small handful of dishonest people (laughs) that stay you know what i'd say 99.9 percent of our guests are phenomenal yeah that that agreed small percentage of people who uh, take advantage. Agreed. Yep. Okay. What about labels in a rental labels or signs? Like, like label maker. Or like, <laughs> yeah. A, mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't have any of those. No, I can see that they would be helpful though. I must say. Yeah. Yeah. And we just went to a, a high end rental and they had some and there it serves a purpose. I think we're, we have one actually because our our under counter fridge the freezer oh, yeah. door is a little finicky uh-huh. so it tells people to close the freezer door as well for us up yeah. Yeah. aside from that we've I'm sure it would be helpful but we veered away from it aesthetically I don't think either of us yeah. is on board with it but uh-huh. it places with them I, I don't think they're necessary I stayed at one place everything was labeled it was yes. like had, it's like band-aids uh, <laughs> extra toilet paper like everything and it's like well, I could open the drawer and figure that out pretty quickly but yeah um but it's a slippery have, slope I already knew where it was slope. so yeah if you're if you're a little bit uh over the top with your label maker maybe avoid it but uh, yeah I was a little surprised this place we stayed in it was gorgeous it was unbelievably pretty but everywhere they had stickered like on counter services everything sticker qr codes for like looking up their like mm. rules and stuff for how and to aesthetically do that's a look i know and look, you know yeah. why not just have a book and I, I get it people don't read things i understand that you know you think that you can be like super clear with your instructions and whatever people still aren't going to read it even if you sticker up your counter I or know. the people that are will the people that aren't won't yeah, yeah they'll ignore it anyway yeah. yeah but I do think it's helpful to have something in there that people can access that yes oh on how to use I'm a big fan of a thorough guest book yes. I yes. just I stayed at my friend's dad's beach house this is like 10 years ago long before my first rental and he had post-it notes 
all over the house. He didn't rent it to strangers. It was just for like family and friends. And it felt like he was like watching over our shoulder. Like it did not feel like we were enjoying our time. It was like, he's going to be, we're going to get in trouble if we do something wrong. And I can't get over that. They still have that feeling for me of like, this is not my place, even though I'm renting it. Someone's like telling me what to do every step of the way. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point. You know, is, do people get that feeling if there are labels, even if they're meant to be helpful, does it make you feel as though, you know, you're not being given credit or, or you're not, you're not able to figure it out yourself. And yeah. Wonder, even if, if subconsciously that factors in when you're labeling everything, right? Because I think about it a lot. Yeah. People are reasonably smart and the people that aren't, are going to do what they're going to do. No matter that's what. right. Label or no label. And my, the biggest compliment, I think when I read in the guest book or get messages from folks after their stay is like, especially repeat guests, they're like, this feels like our home away from home. Like, it feels like when they're there, it's theirs. And that's how I want it to feel that we're not there. Like when you're coming back to your cabin once a year, or one of our guests comes twice a year in each of the seasons. And like for a full week, he just comes by himself and escapes. And I love the idea that he feels like this is his cabin too, because it is, that's why we built it. Right. And I would worry with too much instruction that it doesn't feel like that anymore. Has he added any labels? <laughs> no, but in his, in his defense or to his credit, we do not provide a label maker. for <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? I mean, in some ways, if he felt so at home that he needed to let other guests know about like quirky <laughs> things, I think I'd that kind of like so that. Cute. Yeah. <laughs> that would be so funny. Oh, guys, what a treat. Plus two for the Canadians again. We've had so many good Canadian podcast conversations. Yeah, you've had some great interviews. The The Canadians, though, like Sasha and Pete yeah. and um, who was the other one? Oh, Steve from The Land. Yeah, yeah, we really actually we were driving to Quebec when we were listening to that episode. And it was it was great. He seems like a rad dude. He totally is. I got off that podcast and I was calling my dad on the way home, just like buzzing with energy. Cause I just feel like people who are that passionate about what they're doing, it's just, it's contagious. Yes. And especially as you know, this is a roller coaster in different phases of the project and hosting in life. You have more or less energy to put into it. And so having conversations with people like that and people like you all who are just like, have a different perspective and different thoughts are so helpful for me. I mean, selfishly, that's why I do this podcast. It's just fun for me. Honestly, it's been great. It's been really fun to listen to you and we are flattered to be a part of it. And it's so nice to meet you because we see you all the time online and you kind of put yourself online. Like you're everybody's, like, you're just like a friend. I think that's the way that you put yourself online, you know, like you just kind of are there and it's comforting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. There and you're like, Hey guys, so what do you think? And it's like, yeah, <laughs> I could talk back to my phone to this person. Like there's not a lot of accounts like that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I made a rule when, when I first started it and I, in, in fairness, I have a business where I'd been doing it for a while, but for this one, I remember one morning I had something I wanted to share, but I just woken up and I looked a total mess and I was like, Oh no, I have to like shower and do my hair first. And I was like, no. And that's when I made the rule. I was like, I'm just going to show up exactly as I am every day. And I'm not, cause if I waited to shower and put makeup on, I would, post once every two weeks if we're being honest oh yeah totally and um, that has made it a lot easier yeah it was actually cam who put me on to your account and he is not a social media user but he followed you way before i did because he's always followed pete oh you know pete and yeah so no wonder you're good people and cam was like you gotta follow this cozy rock you gotta like she's really doing this cool thing on social media and i was like what do you know about social media <laughs> That's so I, funny. I, what I, a compliment. I, 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 and something I was like, oh yeah. So I I saw this today and, and Lauren said, oh Janice again. <laughs> Before I followed you. This is exactly what Sean said about Pete during the entire build. Oh, you were on the phone with Pete again. <laughs> and then I followed you and then I like tucked my tail and I was like, she's pretty good. <laughs> oh, guys, thank you so much. It was really good to meet you in real life. And hopefully one day we'll get to come north and stay at either this tree house or one of the new ones. Oh, we'd love to. We have talked about doing a Canadian tour because I've discovered so many cool Canadian places, like taking like three weeks off work and driving north and just going from one cabin to the next and like documenting it all. Like you have endless places to stay. Right. And could I write this off? Like, that's the real question. Of course you could. Yeah. It seems like a write-off to me. Yeah. So that's maybe our next big trip. 
you should do it. That actually, that's what we did around the Treehouse Conference, like in 2019 before the world shut down. We did this like ep- well, Cam's like I'm going, I'm going to this Treehouse Conference, and I was like, okay, well, I want to come and uh, just give me a minute. I'm just gonna see what else is around there. And I, and then like a week later, I was like, so we're gonna fly to LA and drive all the way up to Portland <laughs> and yes. that little treehouse conference is going to be this little one yeah. like on, for on our and trip. The and then yeah. carrying on yeah. no we had an awesome tour but we did that and we went and we actually learned so much and yeah. took like we stayed and I think of, we'll always think of this place but we stayed at this epic place in Joshua Tree that we took so much inspiration from so going back to like a feeling of a cabin and even though it was so different this like desert mm-hmm. of so much of what we experienced in that cabin we were able to bring back to what the feeling of the interior of the space we wanted to be what it was to be in that place just was magic and it was so simple it wasn't like anything crazy fancy you don't need a ton of bells and whistles that's my biggest takeaway okay you have to answer the last question then before we go which is what makes a cabin a cabin (laughs) and and are all tree houses cabins by default Mm, good question I don't know. I mean, or are they tree houses? No, I guess they like, are these separate categories? Is it, or is it like a Venn diagram with some overlap? Yeah, I think it would have overlap for sure. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I loved, who was it who said something about like escaping to go somewhere that it was like a feeling to go away. Yeah. And it can't, you can't be a full-time resident of a cabin. But then you said it can't be your full-time resident. And then I'm like, but wait a second. We live in a cabin. Yeah. We live in more of a cabin than yeah, our tree house. We live in a log, old log cabin. And, and you so can't argue with that. That is a cabin. And, Quintessential. Cabin. And it is our yeah. primary residence. And so I was actually really thinking about that question because I'm like, okay, well, we have a TV in our house, but we don't have one in the tree house. But I mean, I still think you can have a tree or you can have a TV in a cabin. I don't know. I mean, I think a cabin really is just like a feeling of like calm and little escape, but not necessarily, you don't have to be escaping from something major, just like a place to kind of like rest your head and not have too many distractions and just be quiet. I don't know. What do you think? No, I mean, you make a good point. Cabin, when when I think about cabin, I think of, uh, about something that looks a certain way, but I think you're making a very good point that a cabin, especially these days, could be, you talk about shipping containers, tree houses, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think a cabin really is. And, and this is my favorite thing that we hear about the tree house is how it makes people feel, that they get here and they feel an immediate sense of calm. And, you know, so I, I think to me, a cabin is a place that's tranquil, that that takes you away from whatever your every day is. That's yeah. a cabin to me. And, you know, like we live in a cabin and it definitely doesn't feel like a calm, quiet space for me all the time now, you know? So maybe you can't. <laughs> well, you have two young <laughs> children too. <laughs> I know, but now I'm like, maybe I can't live in my cabin because my home cabin, I'm like, it's not clean. Things are a mess. Things have to be done. Like you feel like things have to be done when you're at home. It's like, but then I also, I have this like love for it when I go away and I come home and I'm like, ah. <sighs> Okay. Because it's certainly better than a regular house, even if it is messy. It's still like in the woods and it still feels like quiet and calm at the end of a day. You know, like it's like dead quiet here. Yeah. Yeah. That's what our people say too. They're like, holy smokes, it's quiet. Okay. So I'm coming to Canada to see your tree houses, but also your log cabin. (laughs) Yes, please. Come stay in Baltic and we live next door and we can hang out. I can't wait. I really, I'm going to look it up on a map and plan this trip for, I think it's, we just traveled to Argentina for two weeks. So that was our big trip for this year, but looking ahead to next year or the year after this is, I'm just going to craft the perfect Canadian getaway. I really think that's our next. When I meet you in real life, we're going to talk about that Patagonia trip. Okay. Yes, please. Have you been yet? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. I will share everything and you should definitely go. It's a hundred percent worth it. Okay. Well, it was okay. so nice to meet you. Thank you it, so much. It was really good to meet you guys. We're going to check back in. I'm sure I'll talk to you on social media, but we should do this again in like six months to a year to check in on how your project is going. Cause I have about seven questions on my list that I never got to. And I'm going to want to hear how that's going. So we'll okay, do this again. Perfect. Part two okay. coming up. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye y'all. Thanks so much for listening. 
And if you like what you heard, feel free to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or share some of your favorite parts over on Apple Podcasts and a review. If you have any suggestions for guests or feedback, you can always find us on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin and the Chalet Frame, spelled C-H-A-L-A. See you next week, and thanks for joining us.